Okay, so I think we can start now. Is that okay with you, uh, Luis and Miguel? Please go ahead. I'm here. <laughs> okay, thank you. And Elias, you are there? Yes, I'm here. Excellent. Thank you very much. So <laughs> let us start with the event. Um, well, so very good morning and afternoon to one and only person here. And thank you for joining us today on the fourth edition of the Mesoamerican Workshop on Cosmology and Gravitation. So with me are present the scientific committee organizers, Professor Miguel Alcubierre, uh, Professor Luis Felipe Rodriguez, and Dr. Elias Castellanos. And as a chairperson, it is my pleasure to introduce to you to the esteemed guests in this today workshop, who have come from several universities, uh, from Germany, Malta, and United Kingdom to Mexico and South America, we have left no stone to turn it to make this workshop a rule event in international event. So I would like to uh, refer also to the many support that have been taking place along this uh, past three edition. Um, uh, let me tell you that the Mesoamerican workshop on cosmology and gravitation was created at the end of 2016, which is first and second editions taking place in Chiapas and the third edition in Mexico City. Since then, one of the most important functions assigned to this event has been to promote and initiate uh, research activities in cosmology and gravitation and related fields in collaboration with scientists through our countries as, as well as abroad. In that regards, uh, we have been honored to interact and learn from several colleagues and friends that have teaching us frontier topics in cosmology and gravitation. Or a special acknowledgement to Julio Fabris, René Loschek, Salvatore Capozzielo, Miguel Sumalacarregui, Borgel Perlick, Martin Hendrick, and Paolo Salucci. And this year, the invited speakers in the program um, uniquely placed it to debate and highlight the key themes, trends, and current topics for the participants. We welcome to Yuta Kunz and Jackson Said Levy. And also, we acknowledge the several colleagues that have been participating with all of us during these years. And in this edition, we'll have the pleasure to receive our speakers, Tessa Baker, Niels Wawerton, Jürgen Misuch, Octavio Valenzuela, Lucas Nellen, and Cesar Lopez. Um, in this edition, we'll hear and learn about several topics that has been relevant in the last year. And the end of the day, we prepare a panel discussion with three of our guests to discuss uh, questions and remarks. And we are proud to announce that this workshop have important results related with an increment in numbers in participants and develops of uh, papers published, collaboration, thesis, academic stakes between students and researchers. So we hope to continue with this successful effort in the next editions. In the rapidly uh, advanced frontiers of science and technology and the increasing importance of international collaboration, we strongly felt that our workshop should, uh, should play a leading role in promoting scientific activities in a worldwide form. This is not only a give and take information exchange with the upside world, but also we intend to promote harmony between different scientific cultures. This can be seen by the increasing number of participants countries along these editions. So of course, uh, this cannot be possible with the cooperation of several national and international sponsors, which is a wonderful effort to construct a bridge between the Mesoamerican community with the rest of the world. So uh, let me conclude by saying that the spirit of a good scientist is to be a permanent student of science because in science, the absolute truth of today are always the relative truth of tomorrow. On the name of Dr. Pilar Carrion, Director of the Institute of Nuclear Science here in Mexico, we sincerely hope you will enjoy this today's of debate and networking, and we encourage all the participants from across the world to make use of these days to the best of their abilities. So thank you for your participation. Okay, thank you, Celia. I think it's my turn. 
So let me say some few words for the inauguration of this event. So good morning, everybody. On behalf of the organizing committee, I need to give your uh, uh, warmest welcome to the fourth edition of the workshop on cosmology and gravitation. This time in uh, this virtual version, due to the current health problems in the world, no, all of us. So uh, I would like to thank to the speakers, and lecturers for accepting the invitation to participate in this workshop. And also I want to thank to the Institute of Nuclear Science and of course the North American Center for Theoretical Physics for helping us in the organization of the workshop. We, we appreciate the assistance of the different authorities who are with, with, with us today, uh, distinguished colleagues and participants of the fourth program 2020. Uh, the main objective of the four uh, workshop on cosmology and gravitation mm -hmm. is uh, to promote, of course, discussions, focus on the uh, themes on the natural lectures, and talks on the frontier topics in gravitation and cosmology and related areas, as well as uh, complement the specialized education of advanced students and encourage collaboration among, among the participants and clearly to promote national, Mesoamerican, and international co collaboration among the, part the participants. I can only give you a warm welcome to the fourth workshop on cosmology and gravitation and thank all of, to all of you in advance for the support side from for all of you. Uh, hoping that the next version of the workshop will be face to face. So welcome again and thank you very much. Okay, yeah, so thank you very much and thank you, uh, Professor Luis Felipe and Professor Miguel Cubierre for being with us in this uh, opening. So we start with the first lecture with Professor Jutta Kunz. Hi, everybody. Um, it's nice to be uh, with you. And uh, now I will try to share my screen. So, um, is it working? Not yet. Not yet. Hmm. No. Do you want to try again? Yeah, um, because um, I <laughs> I just proceeded as before as we tried. Um, now I'm a bit puzzled why it didn't work. Share screen. Here. Okay. Nice. There it is. Yes, it's working. Okay. Okay, so uh, very good. So, um, yes, uh, I, I would like to thank you very much uh, for this invitation. And I must say, um, of course, I would have loved uh, to travel um, to Mexico. Last time I was visiting was uh, two years ago. And it would have been so nice uh, to come again, in particular during this time of year when it's really dark skies, gray uh, here in Oldenburg in Germany. But uh, yeah, hopefully next time it will work again. So um, in my lecture, I will be uh, talking about uh, neutron stars and black holes. And today I think it will be basically our neutron stars. And uh, then uh, I'll continue uh, with the black holes tomorrow, or maybe I, I don't know, we'll see uh, how time will go. So um, yeah, I'll start with a brief introduction, which I just uh, have to do. And uh, then, um, yeah, I'll come to neutron stars. And neutron stars are much more complicated than black holes. Um, therefore, um, my introduction to uh, the neutron stars will be uh, quite a bit longer than what I will have to say for the black holes. And therefore, I will start uh, with GR and uh, then go beyond GR to see uh, some things we might uh, learn from neutron stars uh, beyond GR. And I think the other speakers or some of the other speakers uh, may also uh, address uh, the subject. 
And uh, yeah, then there will be black holes definitely tomorrow and uh, conclusions. So I certainly, I, I must uh, just start by celebrating our subject. <laughs> it's uh, so wonderful here. I would say we're living in uh, another golden age of gravitational physics. Uh, having had uh, the Nobel Prize for gravitational waves, uh, this has, and uh, yeah, and all these observations, this has been and will be such an exciting time for us uh, working in the field. And uh, this year, we had just uh, another Nobel Prize for gravitation physics. And I would say it was very uh, unexpected. And uh, I was so happy uh, to see uh, this Nobel Prize being awarded uh, to the subject of black holes. Actually, for uh, the observational group, so they, they didn't say black holes, so they said compact objects. Um, and so, um, uh, but most of us um, think uh, it, it's most probably black holes. So <clears throat> this is uh, what I definitely uh, have to say. It's just uh, such a wonderful time to be working in the field. And now, um, yeah, <clears throat> let me just uh, give a brief introduction, a brief uh, motivation. And uh, uh, in general relativity, we, we have our theories since a uh, hundred years uh, and um, a lot has been done, but we do have uh, a number of problems. So, uh, when we take cosmology, and uh, this will be discussed uh, in other talks, we have the dark matter and the dark energy, yes, and we see. don't yes. quite know what uh, this is, how to deal with this. So we uh, we have some problem here. Uh, just uh, when you look at compact objects, black holes, we do have singularities, but also the Big Bang. Um, and then we have incompatibility uh, with quantum mechanics. Uh, so. There's lots of questions uh, here where we think um, we might uh, need to go beyond general relativity. And uh, yeah, therefore, in this uh, talk, I will just first uh, always uh, recall a bit about general relativity and then uh, discuss a few theories uh, beyond. Now, of course, I cannot discuss all of them. I just picked a few uh, in particular, some where we uh, have also done some work, uh, but of course I'll be more general than that. And uh, uh, a very old uh, contender is uh, the scalar tensor theories and let's say pan theory and uh, some generalizations of that. So I'll discuss um, these, uh, then we have, let's say, for instance, uh, quadratic uh, gravity, uh, where we have a higher uh, curvature term in the action. And uh, um, so uh, we, we could also um, make or, or work with general relativity from a different point of view instead of uh, yeah, the way we usually work with it, we could also um, we write it in terms of torsion or in our metricity. And uh, so there are also these theories uh, and um, are currently being studied, for instance, uh, by Emmanuel, uh, no, sorry, by Salvatore and uh, other people, uh, F of T theories, or um, uh, one can also think about F of Q theories and just do all these uh, generalizations uh, and see what uh, deviations one will get but in particular for neutron stars, um, this is a, a huge endeavor and, uh, but it, it might be also a really worthwhile endeavor to follow. So when we uh, look at uh, all these uh, theories, we of course uh, should look at our data and uh, there now we should look at uh, what we know from gravitational waves. And uh, what else we know? Solar system, yes, always uh, the solar system. 
um, whatever we know in the solar system um, should hold for our theories. So this is basically what one first looks at when one is considering um, alternative theories. Uh, are the constraints from the solar system are satisfied? And then, of course, uh, yeah, we, we go further and we look at the consequences of strong gravity. And uh, this is uh, what we do when we look at neutron stars, uh, at black holes, and uh, yeah, possibly also some exotic objects like wormholes, which we really like playing uh, <laughs> with, or uh, boson stars, uh, which are still not excluded. Um, so um, yeah, there's lots of uh, things to investigate and study. Let me. Um, start with uh, some neutron star basics. We know how they uh, um, yeah, <clears throat> are produced. Uh, we have a collapse, a core collapse, a supernova, and uh, depending on the mass of the uh, progenitor star, uh, we will end up with a neutron star or a black hole. Uh, the equations uh, which we use, uh, at least in the study case, they are the well-known um, tolman oppenheimer falkov equations. Uh, and here you see uh, the people um, giving us uh, the set of equations. And what one has to do is take the Einstein equations, right? It's general relativity and to uh, take some uh, stress energy tensor and uh, let's say we take an isotropic perfect fluid then uh, we have a certain uh, uh, way of um, um, putting um, our matter into the equations which is mostly uh, done in this way of course one can also do it differently and uh, so now we have some energy density, we have some pressure for this uh, unknown type of matter, uh, some four velocity. And um, in the simple case uh, of uh, it's just a static neutron star, we have a simple answer. So um, with a simple answer, we just need two metric functions. And uh, <clears throat> then we can obtain our set of equations uh, imposing some equation of state between uh, the density and the pressure. And here, this is the crux, right? This is what we don't know and what we would like to know. Um, so here we might learn from astrophysics, from gravity also uh, a lot about uh, nuclear physics and uh, about particle physics. So this equation of state, this is what we don't know. And this makes um, our studies of neutron stars much harder and much more complicated. Apart from that, we also have, uh, of course, uh, to put uh, some non-vanishing energy momentum tensor into our um, equations. So this is what we get. Here we have uh, yeah, the famous diagram, the mass in solar masses and the radius of the neutron stars in kilometers. And uh, all these curves uh, represent some equation of state. And when we look at it, uh, yeah, it's basically a mess, right? We have so many possibilities and this is just a few just a few of the many possibilities we have. And uh, depending on the equation of state, we always get uh, different uh, curves, different relations between the mass and the radius of the star. Of course, uh, we do know that we certainly have uh, now neutron stars with masses of uh, two solar masses. And uh, so we know all these uh, equations of state, which don't go up there, they can be excluded, yes. But um, we have lots and lots of them which go above. So yeah, this is a problem, right? Uh, how are we going to learn about gravity when we don't know what uh, the equation of state is? 
So what else you see in this uh, picture this year is where we would have black holes. And uh, here we would have the causality lemon speed uh, of sound uh, would uh, be greater than um, the uh, speed of light. So now, as I said, we have a big problem, right? We don't know the equation of state. And so we can get almost anything uh, when we make calculations uh, of neutron stars. So how are we going to ever learn something about gravity? Is there some possibility, um, just let's say for instance, from the observations of properties uh, of the neutron stars, um, not uh, gravitation waves, but just their properties. Uh, this might be nice if we would be able to learn something. And so let's uh, look at some of these properties. Um, what uh, I would like to discuss now are universal relations of neutron stars, because um, here, when you just look at the properties of neutron stars, this is uh, basically our only hope uh, that we could learn something because otherwise we still have this enormous um, yeah, number of equations of state, uh, which all give us different things and we cannot really uh, learn about gravity. So what are these uh, universal relations? What one does is one uh, looks at uh, relations between properties of the neutron stars. And when one does not just look at these uh, properties like the moment of inertia or the quadrupole moment or the love number, uh, but one looks at um, nicely scaled um, dimensionless quantities one can really find relations that are basically independent, uh, or at least to a large extent, independent of uh, the, the equation of state. And then, then we have a chance to also learn something about uh, gravity, uh, other models of gravity, because uh, if these relations differ uh, from uh, the GR relations, then we might, uh, in combination, of course, uh, with observations, we might uh, learn something uh, about um, these uh, <clears throat> gravity models. And it's not just uh, up here, these properties of the neutron stars, so uh, they are multiple moments, but it's uh, also uh, when we look at uh, when such a neutron star is excited, how does it de-excite when we do asteroid seismology? Uh, so when we look at quasi-normal modes of uh, such neutron stars, that we can really learn something. So I would like to discuss now some of these relations, um, but uh, yeah, they, they are very good relations, but uh, not exact relations. So the most uh, yeah, famous ones are probably the I love Q relations. What does one look at here? One looks at the moment of inertia. Uh, one looks uh, at uh, the quadrupole moment and uh, the spin-induced quadrupole moment. And uh, one just look also um, at uh, the uh, quadrupole moment, let's say that um, one gets uh, by tidal effect. So when one has a system uh, of two objects as depicted down here, and then one also um, gets some numbers, some, and these numbers are called the tidal love numbers. So this is what this I love Q stands for, moment of inertia, quadrupole moment, and uh, love numbers. Of course, when we just look at um, the single, objects, like here I uh, just uh, depict some to see, uh, uh, to illustrate again the problem for you. When you just look uh, here in the left uh, diagram, we only take uh, the moment of inertia and the mass, and then of course, uh, yeah, we have a mess again. 
uh, whatever the equation of state is that we choose, we get uh, some other curve, just like the mass radius uh, relation. Or here, when you look at the quadrupole moment, and uh, we show it versus the mass, you know, we, we get very, very different uh, quantities. Or the love number, hmm? the love number, the lowest love number, same thing. And uh, here we have already uh, done something. We have uh, scaled it by the mass. So we have some dimensionless quantity, but since we still take the mass um, as uh, the other quantity, uh, which is dimension four, we still get a mess. But now look at this. Isn't this amazing? Now we uh, have scaled um, the moment of inertia and made it dimensionless. And we have taken the dimensionless love number. And uh, yeah, what we get is one line, a single line. And down here, you see the deviations from the best fitting line up here. And uh, yeah, the, the deviations for all these equations of state. Yeah, all what you see here are different equations of state and it doesn't matter what uh, you take, whether you take quark matter, there's all included or hybrids or, you know, or just very conservative neutron matter, or basically neutron matter. It doesn't matter, they all fall here on this curve and um, it's an accuracy of 1% uh, or better. And uh, yeah, so here we have a relation which finally doesn't um, uh, distinguish anymore between all these uh, equations of state. But uh, if we have such a nice relation and uh, now we would look at uh, some other model of gravity and it would give us a different line, yeah, um, then we would be able from observations to yeah, learn something about um, this other model and yeah, possibly uh, excluding is always uh, very difficult, but yeah, uh, put some bounds uh, on the parameters of this model on the coupling constants. Uh, and uh, yeah, this, this would uh, then really, um, be helpful for our understanding and further our understanding. And here you see the same uh, for the scale quadrupole moment. Now we have also made the quadrupole moment uh, a dimensionless quantity and we show it uh, versus the dimensionless quantity of the, uh, <clears throat> here this uh, tidal love number. And we have a beautiful line up here, beautiful line. In case you wonder what is uh, this dashed black line up here, this dashed black line, um, this would just be the Newtonian result. And uh, everything down here, this uh, corresponds to general relativity. So this is all excellent. We have excellent, um, um, universal relations here. And uh, what we can now do is uh, we can try to go to higher multipoles. Now this was just the lowest, the uh, quadrupole moment, uh, spin induced and tidally induced, but we can do better. And uh, in case uh, our measurements at some point uh, will be better, and this uh, might also help us and uh, it might give us some additional insights uh, into this whole thing. So let's go to higher multiple moments uh, and see what's happening here. And uh, I'll just uh, give one example, but um, there's lots and lots of examples. So when we go to higher uh, multiple moments, um, things get a bit worse. However, um, we still retain universal relations. And uh, the conclusion here is, uh, which is also quite amazing, that we can have something that is uh, called free 
peer relations. So I don't yet give very fast spin to the neutron stars, but let them spin slowly. We can take uh, perturbation theory to uh, uh, just uh, yeah, obtain, um, let's say, these uh, multiple moments. Then uh, what uh, is seen as that we really need only a third, a third multipole moment. Uh, and uh, this uh, then is the quadrupole. And then we can express all higher moments when we have the mass, when you have the spin and the quadrupole. So it's, it's very much uh, like uh, for, uh, for our black holes where we have uh, uh, the no hair theorem, which uh, if I neglect charge uh, for the moment, which I then would say it's a two hair theorem because uh, if we don't have charge, we have uh, the mass and uh, we have the spin and then uh, black hole in general relativity, uh, a curved black hole is completely uh, determined and here, these three hair relations mean then that when we're slowly rotating, we basically need only an addition, a quadruple moment. And then we can express all the rest uh, of the higher moments uh, with a reasonable accuracy in terms of these three. And here, this is the example which I wanted to show you. Um, <clears throat> So uh, now we have the next uh, current moment uh, and the quadrupole moment. So we see we have a very nice line again. However, now when we look at our fit to this line, uh, we are now 4%, uh, no longer less than 1%, but 4%. But uh, it can be quite helpful in principle. What are the advantages? Uh, so, I mean, I'm telling this basically uh, because I would like to uh, discuss um, <coughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, the generalized mass of gravity, but uh, already in general relativity. Just uh, looking at these these uh, universal relations, we do have uh, big advantages. And uh, I just uh, would like to give a few examples. Um, imagine, imagine we will be able to measure the mass, the spin period, and the moment of inertia. So if we have these, then we can obtain the quadrupole moment. We don't have to measure it. Uh, we have our uh, I love Q relations. Here we need the IQ relation. And uh, yeah, we can read off the quadrupole moment. And then when we take the three hair relations, so uh, we can even go higher. And uh, so this means we have just measured uh, these three quantities, but we, we will have a, a very uh, well uh, determined exterior uh, gravitational field. And uh, so for if we want to uh, study the orbits, um, then we, we know we can obtain these orbits uh, with a very high precision because now we can we understand uh, the gravitational field uh, much, much better. Um, and of course, we can take other quantities. Uh, this is just one of the examples. We can take other quantities and we can always uh, then use this uh, I love Q or um, higher multiple moment relations to obtain further knowledge, further multiple knowledge uh, uh, about the neutron stars. Then um, some, some other important aspect is um, that with these uh, universal relations, one does break uh, degeneracies. This is important uh, um, also in order to get uh, better accuracy when one is, for instance, looking at uh, waveform models 
one can look at waveform models for X-rays, for instance. Uh, um, and uh, uh, when one is studying pulsars and their hot spots, when one has to model um, these X-rays waveforms. Uh, and uh, these models, they contain a lot of parameters. And now when we take these universal relations, this means we have a reduction of the parameters. And the reduction of the parameters then means that we break some degeneracies that we would have otherwise, and that we would have, therefore, higher accuracy. So this helps in this way. And in this similar way, it helps also um, for gravitation, gra <laughs> gravitation waves. So when we look at uh, binary uh, coalescence, um, we have to model the uh, gravitation, uh, the waveform. And uh, again, we do have large sets of parameters. And now with these universal relations, we reduce these parameters and we obtain more accurate, uh, better results. So this is um, already in GR that um, they can be very helpful in principle. Uh, but yeah, one might wonder, how come? I mean, if we just look at the quantities themselves, um, the dimensional quantities, um, then we always have a, ma a mess, a complete mess, no matter what we look at, mass, radius, or any uh, relation. Uh, how come uh, that with these, uh, that we do obtain these uh, universal relations. And um, this has been studied a lot. And it looks like um, that there is some approximate emergence symmetry when one goes to compact objects. So uh, I've taken this uh, uh, plot here from, uh, uh, this is a, a very nice, uh, physics report uh, by Yagi and Yunus. And uh, so you, you can look at uh, this in much detail. Uh, and uh, in this discussion of why do we get these uh, um, universal relations, um, they have tried lots and lots of different uh, things. Uh, this is uh, the basic conclusion here. You see um, the effective polytropic index, uh, whatever other things, uh, temperature, or uh, and here you see compactness. So when uh, when we have ordinary stars, uh, we are sitting somewhere up here, and an ordinary star has lots of degrees of freedom, lots of parameters uh, to be modeled. But uh, when we come down here for the neutron stars close to the black holes. Um, we are losing um, lots of freedom. And finally, it looks like uh, it's uh, just uh, two parameters uh, basically uh, important. Uh, now the polytropic index has come far down. It's somewhere between 0.5 and 1 typically for neutron stars. And compactness this is getting very close to uh, black holes. And uh, here, when we're then sitting here and looking at these neutron stars, um, when one considers, um, you know, just studies the interior of these uh, neutron stars, then um, one sees that uh, there are isodensity contours, uh, of course, and these isodensity contours, they are approximately self-similar. So um, this seems to be um, the, the basic ingredient here, which um, they have um, said that there's this approximate immersion symmetry, this approximate self-similarity uh, in isodensity contours. And it's this one, when uh, this is changed, then universal relations, uh, they <laughs> don't work anymore. So this seems to be uh, what is 
the basis uh, behind these uh, universal relations here. But of course, it's not only these multiple moments so which allow for universal relations, it's also um, other properties. Uh, in particular, it's quasi-normal modes. And uh, I should say, uh, it's for the quasi-normal modes that uh, they have been seen or discussed uh, first. So the quasi-normal modes one often uh, associates with a ring down after a merger. So the <clears throat> gravitational waves emitted uh, um, here uh, in the ring down. And when one looks at these quasi-normal modes of neutron stars, uh, then one also finds uh, certain types of universal relations basically again for some scaled quantities. What does one have to do for the universal uh, relations here when uh, obtains the quasi-normal modes? Uh, so one looks at the small oscillations and the quasi-normal modes means we have damped oscillations. And uh, so we look at perturbations of the metric, but now we have the matter. So in principle, we also have to consider the matter perturbations. And uh, in rotational physics of uh, the compact objects, we typically uh, say we are looking at even parity perturbations and odd per parity perturbations. And these letter le ones, uh, we call them axial modes, uh, and they are pure space-time modes. So for the actual modes, because uh, they are odd parity, the matter does not contribute, and it's pure space-time. And uh, therefore, actual modes are much, much easier to obtain than the polar modes, the even parity modes, because then the matter really couples and one obtains uh, complicated uh, sets of equations. Uh, in any case, uh, what one obtained so something like the Schrödinger-like equation, but uh, yeah, it's actually now a set of coupled equations. Uh, and uh, it's a set of coupled equations to obtain this eigenvalue omega, uh, which has a real part and an imaginary part. And this imaginary part, uh, yeah, this is because we have, uh, uh, yeah, gravity is uh, dissipative. So um, we have the gravitational waves uh, in most uh, channels uh, that can uh, uh, be radiated from the object. And um, so the real part we interpret as the frequency of the oscillation and uh, the imaginary part, uh, this uh, yeah, gives us the decay rate of when we take the inverse, uh, the decay time. And now these uh, quasi-normal oscilla yeah, quasi oscillations, these uh, modes, they, when we just look at them, uh, again, um, by just taking the, the dimension for quantity, and here I show the real part and uh, show it for a number of different modes. Uh, this is the fundamental mode. Um, then we have uh, an excitation, which is called pressure mode. Uh, and up here, we have uh, then a pure gravitation mode. So at these, uh, yeah, you see for different equations of state, these lines are again different equations of state. We get a mess. Yes, yeah, so maybe down here it's not as messy, but uh, so this is uh, also where the, the first universal relations were observed. But up here, um, yeah, we, we do have a mess uh, for the real part, but uh, and also for the imaginary part. But when we now scale, so that we have uh, some dimensionless uh, number. And down here we had already uh, compactness, which is dimensionless. Then you see omega times r, or we can also take the mass. Um, then it looks much, much better. Now it's not perfect, but uh, things, uh, they um, fall more or less yeah, on a line. So it's, uh, Again, 
a universal relation that we see here for um, these modes. And this uh, is shown for one of these gravity modes. And uh, here, this is now, yeah, I mean, this one was for the real part and this is for the imaginary part. And you see it's not perfect, but we do have quite reasonably uh, looking um, general relativity universal relations. So it's also worthwhile looking at uh, these uh, relations then uh, when we go to generalized or modified views of gravity. And now I have tried to, to convince you that it will make sense um, uh, to look at neutron stars to learn about uh, yeah, alternative theories of gravity, even though we don't uh, know uh, <clears throat> what the equation of state, what the equation of state really is, because we can yeah, uh, look, for instance, here at these universal relations. They give us some very interesting tools. And now let's uh, look at some examples and see whether we, what we find. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, let me, I'll start uh, with the scalar tensor theories. Uh, and um, in general, we could uh, write them this way. I um, mean, the, the old ones, not the more complicated ones. So Hondesky, I will address uh, soon. So here we have some function of the scalar field phi, another function of the scalar field phi. Uh, and uh, this is the action given in the Jordan frame. And uh, the weak equivalence principle is satisfied because uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> we don't have this uh, direct coupling of phi to the matter. We can, of course, and we really like to do that, uh, change our frame and go to the Einstein frame. And then we have uh, everything as uh, we normally uh, of working with, uh, and uh, in that case, uh, this function f, yeah, in front uh, of, uh, where was it, in front of uh, our uh, Fourier scalar, um, this uh, is now, yeah, um, uh, rewritten as a function a of the scalar field in uh, the Einstein frame. This gives us an important relation here. And uh, in principle, we can transform them uh, from one frame to the other, uh, forth and back as we like. And uh, the most famous uh, brand decke theory for, for this one, the function f is just uh, the scalar field phi. And then we have uh, some omega function here. And, uh, it's just a constant in the uh, old uh, Brandstecke theory. And now we can translate and see what does it all um, mean. Now, um, here we have this uh, coupling function alpha. It's obtained by taking the derivative uh, of A, the logarithmic derivative of A, which was related to the function F. And then, yeah. Uh, we know in particular theory, alpha is a constant. It's just uh, some alpha zero. And now we have uh, very good measurements uh, telling us that this value of omega this ought to be huge. So when we take omega to infinity, we end up at general relativity. But for these huge values of omega, yeah, we don't get anything. For neutron stars, uh, it calls, um, it, it's hopeless. The, the change is far too small. But we can uh, be a bit more general. We can make uh, our coupling function A uh, a bit more complicated. So we take an exponential, uh, which has a linear term in the exponential and a quadratic term in the uh, exponential. The linear one just uh, gave us a sticker. But now this one, the quadratic term, this can be very interesting. Of course, uh, 
observations uh, give us already quite strong balance. Uh, at least when we have a massless scalar field. So let's say we have a massless scalar field. And then here you see uh, alpha not uh, vertically and uh, beta uh, you see horizontally. And uh, then we have all these uh, colorful lines. And this means uh, <coughs> this system standing here on the right uh, is excluding everything above uh, the corresponding line. And we see only what is uh, down here in gray. Um, this is what is still allowed, meaning the self or not, yeah, we just uh, discussed it, must be very small. And uh, beta, this beta naught, um, this is also very much restricted already. Uh, now, recent uh, data have restricted uh, even further. But this theory now with the new, more general coupling constant, this gives rise to some very interesting effect. And this very interesting effect, this is um, uh, that we can have matter-induced uh, spontaneous polarization. And yeah, this, this is quite possible. What, what does it mean? I've taken this uh, figure from a lecture of Esposito Perez. And um, yeah, it, it's just trying to picture what's happening. Uh, these figures, you know, from phase transitions, uh, you know, from uh, let's say the Higgs and the early universe uh, uh, becoming a massless field when we have the uh, electric phase transition. So um, yeah, first uh, um, the minimum uh, is right here at vanishing phi, but then under certain conditions, the minimum changes to finite values of phi. This is the scalar field. And uh, yeah, um, so this changes here uh, from positive uh, to negative, meaning that if we have uh, some uh, mass or some effective mass, uh, this would change sign. And if this changes sign, then something interesting could happen because the scalar field uh, could have a finite value, and uh, yeah, we would have a scalarized uh, neutron stars. How does it look uh, in our formula? Now, up here, we just have uh, the Einstein equations. And uh, the interesting equation for us is uh, this Klein Gordon type equation. Yeah? We have um, the Lala version, and then we have from uh, we have a source term, and T is the trace of the energy momentum tensor. We have this alpha coming from the coupling. Um, uh, so in here, we now have this beta zero, and uh, yeah, just uh, the constant. And now if we, uh, yeah, for comparison, I've uh, written it once more, uh, like uh, the Klein gordon uh, equation, however, uh, it, it's obvious um, this is an effective mass term, and this effective mass term does uh, depend on space. Yes, it's uh, uh, because our um, energy momentum tensor is, of course, not constant uh, for the star. But uh, the important point is this term, um, which is like an effective mass term, this is negative. And it's going to uh, induce some tachyonic instability. Sorry about that. Um, so we will have a tachyonic instability. And uh, uh, of course, um, things don't happen just when we change sign. It's more complicated than that. What we have to do is so we have to make a mode analysis. We have to look at uh, when does the GR solution or GR neutron star become unstable with respect to, to this uh, scalar field, with respect to developing a finite uh, scalar field somewhere? And um, 
This is from this beautiful paper by Menes uh, and uh, Artis. And uh, yeah, mode analysis, just uh, what I discussed. So we uh, make our analysis uh, with the uh, omega, the eigenvalue, having a real part and imaginary part. And now let's look at this imaginary part. And we see when this imaginary part becomes negative, uh, we have an unstable mode. Now we have a runaway solution. We have a negative mode uh, um, must a negative mode must develop uh, for the GR solution, but before this develops, there will be a zero mode, right? And uh, here we have the real part of omega, and we have the imaginary part of omega versus uh, compactness for uh, uh, some neutron star equation of state doesn't matter. And uh, the black uh, lines here, they are GR. So we see black becomes zero right here where skeletalization starts. Then the, um, the real part stays zero and uh, it becomes positive again when skeletalization ends. Uh, the imaginary part is first positive in the GR case, then has a zero mode. And here we have a negative mode. Yeah? So here GR is unstable with respect to scalarization. So in this area of uh, uh, the compactness and uh, general relativity will not be the most favorable solution, but uh, it will be the scalarized uh, neutron star. And then here it stops again. What uh, you also see nicely in this diagram, um, this is uh, uh, here, the, these curves in the middle, uh, they are just for two different scalarization functions. These curves, uh, uh, they show that one does have a, a real um, quasi-normal mode. And it's a quasi-normal mode in the uh, zero, L equal to zero channel. So there's a, a new type of radiation possible for neutron stars. So uh, gravitational, relation, uh, gravitational radiation uh, that has L equal to zero. It's not just the dipole with L equal to one, which we will have uh, when we have the scalar field. We can also in principle have some uh, uh, L equal to zero, some monopolar uh, uh, radiation for uh, GR black, uh, GR neutron star, this is of course not possible because outside, uh, um, yeah, uh, uh, we, uh, we know the solution, right? We, we cannot uh, uh, um, have uh, these gravitational waves in a spherically symmetric space time. So we, we can have pressure waves, but they cannot emit. But no, we have uh, a scalar field around. No, they can. So this is very interesting. Apologies. Uh, can you hear me? Apologies. Uh, you have 10 minutes. Oh, OK. Thank you. Thank um, you. So now let's, uh, let's look at uh, um, how uh, things change now for the neutron stars in such a scalar tensor theory. What we have here is um, um, the mass radius relation for Oh, sorry, for one equation of state. And uh, we have, uh, this is the static set. Uh, and up here we have the uh, very fast rotating uh, set of solutions where we are, as we say, uh, the Kepler lemma. We cannot have the rotate faster than that. And then we see, this is uh, how it looks like when you have scalarization. Uh, we have scalarized, uh, 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 scalarization that is, is much uh, bigger when we have a fast rotation, but yeah, most neutron stars don't really rotate so fast. And now, uh, when you go to the slow rotation case, and uh, we, we look at our <laughs> uh, our uh, 
uh, relations, uh, universal relations, that we uh, want to learn something, then we see now we, we obtain basically GR. So the fit in GR and the fit in scalar tensor theory, um, they are very much on top of each other. So here we cannot learn much. Um, same uh, here, um, it won't uh, give us much. But uh, when we go to uh, fast rotation, then things uh, um, give us a fourth here, which I did talk about before, because now, uh, depending on a, a fixed rotation parameter J, which is uh, now also uh, the scaled quantity, um, we have a slight dependence uh, on, um, on J. Uh, we might call this a uh, 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 fourth here if we like to. This uh, depends on J. But uh, we will also have, and this is the, the new thing here, we will also have um, uh, new universal relations uh, that uh, concern the scalar field. So uh, the scalar charge, for instance, uh, um, is shown down here. Uh, so uh, the scalar charge and uh, the, the higher moments of uh, the scalar field. Uh, we can look at the quadrupole, the hexadecopole. So we do have uh, these uh, additional uh, um, universal relations, which now also include uh, the scalar field. Unfortunately, um, we don't see much deviation from GR, except uh, yeah, that there is the scalar field. However, if we look at um, positive modes, it, it improves a bit. So here we have extra quasi normal modes, and you see the black is what we have for GR, and the blue is distinctly different uh, when we uh, have a scalar tensor theory with a certain parameter. We can improve this even more by saying, hmm, let's now uh, give the scalar field a mass. If we give the scalar field a mass, then uh, our um, bounds are not as stringent, so we can go to higher uh, values of the coupling. And then let's say um, we take the blue curve here, so there's no self interaction. Um, then we do get uh, for the um, universal relations uh, quite a difference, right? So it's quite different from the black uh, from uh, GR. So there could be some hope in seeing something. Um, yes, uh, I would like to uh, give a few more examples. And one example I would like to uh, address is uh, Horndesky gravity. So our Lagrangian or action is now much more complicated, uh, uh, but it still gives us uh, um, equations of motion of second order, which is nice. And, uh, Cosmologists used to love that also. In particular, they used to look at uh, certain subsets. Uh, and uh, here, one of the famous uh, subsectors, this is FAB4. And it corresponds to uh, some special class now, uh, which contains general relativity, George, uh, Einstein, Dilat, and Gauss Bonnet, Ringo. Um, then a non minimal coupling to the Einstein tensor, John and uh, the double dual of the Riemann tensor Paul. Now, <clears throat> those of you who are um, cosmologists uh, will tell me, come on, don't uh, bore us. Why are you talking uh, about this? We have excluded this long ago. Uh, no, long ago, um, not that long ago, but uh, <clears throat> uh, with the measurements uh, from uh, the uh, the gravitation waves uh, 1708 17. Uh, we could compare uh, the speed of gravitational waves and uh, the speed of light. And um, there was a very, very stringent bound. So, uh, looking at this bound from a cosmological point of view, 
Uh, they said, oh, now we can exclude all of this year, uh, all of those that are sitting in this red, and uh, we just keep uh, some in the green. And Tondesky had four of these things, uh, Gauss Bonnet, um, they are sitting here uh, in the red. But um, this, uh, this exclusion, this uh, really uh, means only uh, it's for late time application of these models, right? It was uh, looked for dark energy when you have a corresponding background. Uh, and yes, uh, then uh, uh, it may exclude uh, some of these models. I, I uh, do uh, agree on that, even though one can um, construct some counterexamples. Uh, so these counterexamples, they, um, yeah, you, you might still say they, they give some relations between parameters or say one has to satisfy a certain differential equation. Uh, you might find them contrived. However, I would say, um, no, I, I don't really care. Um, you may solve uh, late time cosmology in a different way. Um, um, it's not uh, this what these theories uh, will give us. Uh, uh, and uh, I will still employ them for compact objects. So for compact objects, one has to redo this whole analysis, of course. Look uh, at uh, um, the speed again uh, of gravitational waves and compare. But no, it's a completely different thing. We don't have a uniform background anymore. We have a background uh, that uh, is very much space dependent. And uh, when we look at uh, deviations uh, from one, when we look at the ratio, um, these uh, deviations, they are proportional to the scalar coupling and uh, they go with high powers of the radius or so R cubed or fourth and so on. Uh, and uh, this has been studied by a number of groups uh, showing now no, we uh, don't get balance from uh, these compact objects. So for compact object, this is fine. And um, I thought I just uh, discuss it before, so you might stay with me, but I don't have much time anyway anymore. Uh, so maybe um, this is the last example uh, for today. Um, I have here one of these uh, Wondensky theories, so it's George and John. And uh, what we see is quasi-normal modes. It's actual quasi-normal modes. Uh, polar quasi-normal modes have not been studied much, um, just because it's, it's much more complicated. But what you see here is, uh, here you have one relation for GR, the upper one, the upper curve. And you have a completely different relation uh, for uh, Hondeski. Um, and uh, yeah, one ought to be able to distinguish between the two. So this was um, uh, the uh, real part. Here we have the imaginary part. So it, it's completely different. And um, yeah, so it's a very nice example, I would say, that we can distinguish uh, between these theories. Um, so um, <clears throat> I think this is a point where I can stop now. Um, actually, um, Celia, would it be OK if I continue here tomorrow? Yes, please. Thank you. And if you want, uh, we can start the question session. That's OK for you? Uh, this is fine for me, yeah. So yeah. I, I just uh, finish up the neutron stars tomorrow and then do the uh, uh, black holes. Perfect. Um, well, we have a couple of questions. Uh, Sebastian Bamonte want to ask you something. Sebastian, if you want. Yeah. Yes, so hello, Dita. So thank you for your talk. So my question is related to the universal relations. So uh, I really like this idea of having this universal relation, but I don't understand like the physical reason why this uh, specific combination appear. So is there any like hidden concept quantity which is not uh, like some hidden there? 
what is the reason why is only this IQ or, for example, this love Q relation appears and not another relationships? I mean, it, there should be something hidden going on, maybe that some kind of concept quantities that uh, one cannot see directly from the equation. Um, yeah, it, it's uh, a very, um, <laughs> I would say, very difficult to uh, to really see uh, mm -hmm. the equations uh, where this would come from. Um, when when just uh, Newtonian gravity instead, uh, things become easier. And then one can look at um, the equations because the multiple moments are uh, much better, uh, can be handled in a much better way. Um, and uh, in that case, one can uh, uh, see from the equations uh, that um, yeah, this uh, self-similarity of the isodensity contours, um, uh, this uh, does give rise then uh, to the universal relations, uh, and uh, one, one, one can study it very nicely in this case. Uh, it seems to just uh, survive uh, this way for general relativity, but there uh, one has not that much insight into the uh, equations anymore. I mean, uh, extracting, extracting these uh, higher multipoles, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, we, we, we do it very differently. Yeah? We, we don't have these uh, nice integrals or uh, the neutron star uh, and its interior. So we can really, uh, we, we don't see it. Uh, but uh, for in the Newtonian case, so one can see it and it's, it's uh, nicely discussed in this uh, paper here in this uh, physics report. Um, for the quasi normal modes, um, yeah. I, I would not know whether there is anything else um, uh, apart from this um, that uh, might give rise uh, to these uh, universal relations again. So it's very hard to understand and um, people have thought about uh, long and deep uh, and, and tried lots of things and uh, yeah. this is, I would say, the, the answer they came up with. Do you think that there is any like uh, invariant going on there? Because if you change from one equation of state to another one, then you have exactly the same kind of cure, curve. So I imagine that there is kind of uh, some invariant or some concept quantities hidden somewhere, I don't know where, uh, but actually it's important in this case because you have this uh, like kind of very invariant uh, uh, quantity. Um, invariance, I, I did not uh, fully understand, you know, we, we don't have uh, any um, invariance uh, in terms of which to really discuss um, that. I think we have compactness um, and uh, yeah, <clears throat> I uh, I'm sorry, I have no better explanation uh, for you. Um, uh, I mean, if um, this has caught your interest, uh, maybe you can, up, can come up with uh, some, some uh, further um, uh, yeah, <clears throat> explanation, but um, that's it so far. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It could be located. I mean, um, that was uh, where, uh, where one could see changes, you know, um, breaking of um, uh, this, uh, these universal relations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, there is another question from Che Yu Chen. If you want to speak your question or you would like to, I will read it. Yes, no problem. Thank you. So first of all, thank you for your talk. Uh, it's very uh, clear. So my question is about uh, the, uh, uh, the the parameters alpha and beta that you introduced in the uh, tensor scalar tensor theory. And it seems that one of them alpha can be tested quite well uh, using neutron star, but the other still have some uh, available range of parameter space. So 
are they related to the post Newtonian parameter? Uh, if we expand the, uh, for example, the metric and can they be related for the one PN or two PN parameters, something like that? Mm. I, I haven't looked at that. I must say um, I, I cannot answer this, but um, um, they, they enter, of course, uh, in this. Um, uh, and uh, so when one does this uh, such a, an expansion, um, and it's also um, these uh, people, their Alex and uh, and colleagues, they they actually use this uh, post Newtonian um, uh, approximation when they uh, obtain their bounds. So it, it it's uh, used there, it's included there, but I, I cannot give you the direct uh, um, connection. But uh, the, this beta zero. You see, it, it's uh, uh, limited here, but uh, here we still have some uh, some degrees of freedom. Unfortunately, when we have a, a mass for this, uh, when we have no mass for the scalar field uh, scalarization, uh, it arises when we're close to this bound. And uh, therefore, it's nice uh, when we can go beyond by, yeah. <clears throat> just making this bound weaker by giving the uh, scalar field a mass. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jay. Um, Salvatore, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Yuta, for this very nice talk. I enjoyed it very a lot. I have just this question. Um, you speak about the fact that uh, on this theory can uh, theories can be ruled out by this experiment. There is this paper by Lombrosier and the other that you mentioned before. There are other evidence uh, beside this uh, event that exclude on this theories or not, as far as you know. Um, I I do not know of any further uh, exclusion. I mean, we, we do have uh, further restrictions on some of the parameters. We certainly have, and I'll talk about that uh, then uh, tomorrow also a bit, uh, and also in connection with black holes. But exclusion of the theories, I would say no. Um, I, I don't know of any. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's thank uh, Yuta for her nice uh, talk. Thank you very much, Yuta. We continue tomorrow. And uh, before uh, going to the next lecture, I mean, this is an invitation. If you want, uh, we, uh, we can do it uh, right now. We are going to take the official photo of the event. So all are invited to turn off your camera. Uh, that will be nice. And Yuta, if you want, uh, you can stop your share your screen. If this is possible, excellent. Thank you very much. So, so here we are. And I think we are ready, Martin, if you. Aline, is it ready? I will, I will take the picture. Yes, wait, wait okay. a second. Let me just don't uh, just smile and don't move because we have five five groups of people here. So please just be patient. Thank you. Smile, smile, everyone. We are doing it. Ready? We'll send the picture uh, later.